Hello and welcome everyone. Welcome to our first UNH Equine Program live webinar. I'd like to introduce our expert speakers today. Um, they have generously agreed to join us and um, we are excited to have them and all of you with us this evening. So first, Bill Hogg is joining us as the founder of Equitech. Equitech is the leader in measurement, modeling, and design of high-performance equestrian riding surfaces. Their technology is used at the top level of international competitions, such as FEI Five Star Show Jumping Competition and Dressage at the Winter Equestrian Festival and the Adequan Global Dressage Festival. Their partnership with Spy Coast Farm in Kentucky is advancing the state-of-the-art interface between the surface and the young equine athletes. Bill has worked in high tech for over 40 years and was one of the inventors of the ethernet. He holds 70 patents and has published 25 peer reviewed academic papers. We are also joined by Dr. Katie Rayner. Dr. Katie Rayner is one of the practitioners at the New England Equine Medical and Surgical Center in Dover, New Hampshire. Dr. Rayner runs the field services as well as the in-clinic emergency and critical care practice there. She is an active three-day eventing competitor throughout the competition season in Area 1 and 2, including winter training in Aiken, South Carolina. She also practices equine medicine in Aiken during the winter training season. And with that, I'd like to hand over the mic and we can get started. We have a lot to cover tonight. Oh, and before we do that, if you uh, have any questions throughout tonight's topic, please utilize your chat feature and we'll take questions as they come up. And we also have some time for a Q&A at the end of the discussion. And okay, we should be online. This is Bill. Uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for spending the time. Uh, there was a lot of other things you could be doing. You could be riding your horse or working on your trailer. So you chose to do this or eat, eating dinner. You could be doing that too. So we appreciate this. Um, the seminar is going to be divided into four parts. I'm going to go first and then Dr. Rayner will go second. You should see this slide. We're going to talk about some of the things that can go wrong and when they do go wrong, what happens to the horse. Then we're going to talk about the top safety considerations and uh, Dr. Rayner will talk at the end about how to keep your horse healthy while traveling uh, and we'll talk about different types of trips. This seminar is going to be quick. There's a lot of information in it. You'll have access to the slides afterwards and there's a lot of um, addendum material. It's based on a seminar that we did a couple of years ago sponsored by the USCA. That was a day long seminar that also included a rescue of horse from a, a trailer. Uh, so this is uh, much shorter than that. Okay, we'll try to get to the next slide. Stand by everybody, we're trying to figure out how to actually advance our slides. Okay, what can go wrong? <laughs> Uh, the slides can go wrong, uh, but I'll just leave you with this. Just because nothing bad happened doesn't mean it's okay. So this is a study uh, based on 800 horse trailer accidents by the Technical Large Animal uh, Rescue Site. The number one cause of tire is tire blowouts or loss of a wheel, poorly maintained equipment, um, incorrect sizing of the vehicle and the weight of the trailer. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. We have an example of gooseneck trailers. A lot of gooseneck trailers we see are under trucked. Inexperienced drivers will give you some tips about that and so on. Um, this is pretty much in rank order. We're gonna focus on the top issues, not all of these issues. So first let's start about uh, talking about some things that actually happened that maybe aren't so comfortable. Um, the message on this slide, this is from an accident in California in March of 2014, is a professional driver followed his GPS over switchbacks uh, because it looked like it was a shortcut to the destination, uh, tipped over the trailer and killed two horses. 
Um, so what can we learn from that is never transport a horse in a trailer using just GPS. Always know how to get there. Um, this one's maybe a little more disturbing, even if you can believe it. Um, the horse fell through the floor of the trailer, was dragged under the trailer and died in Hawaii. So the owner, the operator uh, with the four other horses who were not injured, left the dead horse and proceeded on their way. So there's a lot of wrong things that happen there, as you can see. Obviously, we're trying to get your attention here with some of these. This accident happened uh, nearby here in the seacoast area. It's uh, uh, No one was injured and there were no horses in it, although it did total a brand new truck. Um, they were traveling uphill and they were only going 15 miles an hour. It was winter. And you might say, how could they total a truck going 15 miles an hour going uphill? Um, well, I'll show you. What happens is when you're going uphill, you can lose traction of the drive wheels. And since there's a camber or a crown on the road, they'll tend to slip to the outside of the road. And this driver made three um, common errors, putting uh, more gas to get more traction that just spun the wheels more. They corrected late with slow steering corrections. That was the second fail. And then panic braking. Uh, panic braking, whether you're on, um, you know, any slippery surface like ice or snow or whatever, it locks the wheels and so you can't steer, uh, you can't turn, uh, you can't accelerate. The vehicle goes in whatever the last direction it was pointing. Uh, what happens in this case is the gooseneck contacts the cab of the truck and either flips the truck or when the truck gets sideways into the ditch, the truck flips. Um, this is a real common um, type of accident with gooseneck trailers. This accident happened in Rentham, Mass in 2012 and uh, on an off-ramp of a highway off of uh, Route 495, uh, the northbound off-ramp. And the horse sadly died and the second horse went into surgery. Uh, and so the question is, what happened here? How could this happen? Here's an aerial shot of that. And there's a lot of things to look for in this. First of all, it's a long off-ramp and it was a downhill off-ramp also. Long off-ramps are intended to get you safely off the road and slow down, not an additional lane to keep going fast in. And in a car, you might be able to navigate this downhill turn, but with a trailer, you're not able to navigate it. And what happened was they overshot the turn and then panicked, turned the wheel even more to try to get stay on the road, and then jackknifed the trailer got the uh, trailer flipped. The correct thing to do here would have actually been to sacrifice your ego and just go straight. Just drive on the grass, on that big triangle of grass, um, and there would be no harm, no foul. Your ego would be harmed, but nobody else would be harmed. And so on off ramps, you have to get slowed down. If you can't see around the corner, uh, while you're approaching the corner, then um, you don't really have a sense of what the speed should be. The, it's very common for a novice error, uh, in this case, to overcorrect and, and try to stay on the road when uh, it would be better to just drive straight onto that grass. Um, this is a, a photo I, I took out at Millbrook a few years ago. Um, a professional came in and had a blowout on the way, and you can see some of the damage from that and proceeded to high side the trailer on the crest of the hill. If anybody's been to Millbrook, they probably can guess exactly where this happened. Um, and this was a little bit of a challenge to get the horses off. No one was injured on this. This is just an example of a driver error. If you're ever down south, like if you go to Aiken or something in the winter, you're aware uh, there are certain railroad crossings where you can actually get your trailer stuck over it. So watch out for um, getting high sided. This is a pretty scary looking accident, although the horse was not injured, it's, it survived this amazingly. Uh, but the, this was out right by the horse park in um, Kentucky. And what I'm trying to show you here is what happens to these horse trailers when they're in an accident is they basically turn into a giant box of razor blades and then they descend on the horse. 
And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Rayner. She's going to talk about what happens to the horse in this situation. Hi guys, thanks everyone for joining. Um, these next couple of slides can be a little bit disturbing for some people. Um, and the reason I'm putting it up there is because it's, um, it's things that we've seen in the hospital after a trailer accident. Um, obviously we get, we get the worst ones at a referral center, but um, I think it's important for people to understand that driving a, a, a trailer most of the time goes well. It's like skating down a, or uh, skateboarding down a hill. It's really fun until it doesn't go well. Um, so when it, when it goes bad, unfortunately, the horse is usually the one that, that ends up with the most, most issues. So I, I do want to show you guys what happens so that we can really take this seriously with, um, with what Bill Bill's trying to accomplish. So what happens to the horse? Um, for the, the, the good, the really bad trailer accidents, you usually see injuries from the head to the, to the tail. You, you see road rash pretty much everywhere. And so that is what this image is. This horse um, fell out of a moving trailer when the, the back door wasn't hitched uh, on a highway. Um, so that's a, the yellow line is, pointing to an incisor that got fractured, and those are his hind feet right um, over the fetlock joint, um, along with abrasions over the, the pastern and coronary band. Um, this horse wasn't booted when he was in the trailer um, on the way to a horse show. These are a couple more uh, images that are pretty drastic. The one showing the withers, um, you can see the fascial plane, so quite deep to the muscle, um, an open wound, um, on that side, and then his knees, so their carpus in both fronts um, are down to the bone, um, along with other road rashes on his fetlocks. Um, and then these are just close up images that yellow uh, arrow is pointing to bone um, that got kind of shaved off from the road rash, and all the rest of it is an open wound. Um, so, pretty, pretty drastic image of a, of a pretty decent trailer accident. Um, and then this one may not look as bad. It's a different horse, obviously, but may not look as bad, but really it is quite a, quite a good injury for this horse. He was in a trailer um, that went around a corner quite quickly and the divider in the trailer was not all the way to the ground. It was one of the um, half dividers. And this horse was going around a turn and um, the owner had to pop their brakes on quite quickly. So he scrambled and lacerated his um, coronary band, as you can see there. I don't know if you guys can see my arrow, but um, he had to be casted for two weeks um, and end up scratching from one of, the, one of his FEI events. So he was out of, of working for probably about three months um, until that healed, which is a lot of disappointment for the owner and for the horse. Okay. so. Hopefully we've gotten everybody's attention with that. So let's talk now about how to prevent these sorts of things, some safety considerations. And again, I would encourage you to download the slides and look in detail through the items that we're talking about. I had asked Liz earlier whether there would be an exam later for the people at UNH who are uh, taking this. And these are the questions that'll be on the exam. Uh, and they relate to, uh, the top issues, basically tire pressure and tires, we're gonna talk about that, the bearings, the hookup of the trailer, pilot error, and as uh, Jeff Goldblum said in Jurassic Park, nature finds a way, and so do the horses. The first thing to understand, and we see this a lot if, if you're on any of the chat groups or whatever, somebody had a blowout, of uh, the trailer tire while traveling or whatever to an event or transport or whatever. And the, the average discussion is that's really terrible, obviously. And how could that happen? And that's, that's you, you know, that's such a random thing. No blowouts are random. There's a cause for all blowouts. Um, and Einstein had said that God did not roll dice with the universe. The only things that are random are things we don't yet understand. And so the number one reason for the blowouts is there's not enough air in the tire. Uh, you have to set the tire to the cold tire PSI rating. It's printed on the side of the tire. And that air is what holds the tire up. When the tire gets hot, it will inflate higher 
um, which is fine. Don't decrease that air. Um, leave it the way it is. Uh, they're designed to get hotter. And they get hotter because of the flexing on each revolution. Um, and if you set the tire pressure too low to have a soft, cushy ride, you generate more and more and more heat. Okay, and that's what then causes the delamination. Um, a little note, if you looked at all of your tires, which is the most important tire of the truck and trailer, it's the right front truck tire is the most important because if that blows, that pulls the rig off the road to the right. And so that's uh, really the most important tire that you have, okay? Um, every time you hook up your trailer, whether you put your horse in or not, but especially if you put your horse, check the tire inflation every time. Uh, this is how you'll catch slow leaks or whatever. If you have a slow leak, you wanna really get that fixed um, because a long trip, you, I know of a case where someone was going to um, Kentucky, to Lexington uh, from the East Coast and got a blowout in a slow leak tire. It eventually leaked down enough so that then it was underinflated and um, you know you got that blowout. Here's what it looks like when the blowouts happen. Um, uh, perhaps somebody's on the call here that actually had a blowout. They're pretty violent. You can hear them. It sounds like an explosion because it is. Uh, it often will rip off the uh, fender. It can rip off the uh, brake wire and you need to check that and, and so on. It's good to know whether you're actually physically capable of lifting your spare. Um, and that's not to disparage anybody. Some spares on big trailers, uh, no one can lift. You need uh, equipment to do it, to put it on. And so um, know if you can lift your spare. You might be able to get it off of the mounting on the trailer, but not back on. So you're gonna put it in the um, tack room or the bed of the gooseneck or, or somewhere. If you have dry rot, as you can see in that picture, you need to get rid of that tire. Don't drive with that tire. It's important to understand that tires, trailer tires in particular for this application, they age out, they don't wear out. You'd have to put a lot of miles on it, driving miles, to wear them out. Um, ozone, light, heat cycles prematurely age out a tire about five years and they're done, sadly. And so most of our tires are going to look really good when we say they're too old, I have to replace them. On the side of all the tires, um, on one side, you'll have to find it and I advise you to go look for it now since we're not competing or anything now, so we might as well do all of this stuff, is find that code and it's a four digit code. This is 1612. What that means is the tire was made in the 16th week of the year 2012. So write that down on the tire with a paint stick or uh, notes in the tack room so you can track how age, aging these tires are becoming. Uh, if you're storing the tires, uh, you know, you see this with people with RVs, they're putting these covers over them. It's not vanity, it's basically keeping the uh, light off of them uh, to prevent them from prematurely aging, okay? Uh, that, so that's what we're gonna say about tires, but the number one thing is have a reliable tire pressure gauge and check the tires religiously all the time. That is the major cause of accidents and of blowouts, is just not enough air in the tires. Now, wheels can come off, the whole wheel, everything comes off, and it's amazing, it's a 49 cent piece of hardware that keeps it on there. It's either a cotter pin or a tang washer. And the, the way the failure works is the bearings are either loose or they're not lubricated. The wheel will start to wobble. Uh, if you look at your trailer tires, and see a scalloped wear pattern, then there's a good bet this is what's happening. This generates a massive amount of heat in the bearings. The bearing breaks apart, the wheel wobble gets worse. You can see it's like the China syndrome, it just keeps going and going. Eventually the entire wheel hub ev breaks, everything flies off. Uh, it can't be put back on at that point if you damage the hub. Um, often people who've had this happen report that the wheel passes them on the road just goes right by them because it's nothing holding it back. So that sounds pretty scary. Obviously, if you're having your trailer inspected every year, this is one of the major things you're having inspected, but we should be able to do it ourselves. And this is how you do it. If you have your trailer aid, you drive, this will take a little bit of time because you've got four wheels to do. You drive up on it and then you see if you can 
see any uneven wear pattern on the tires? Can you wobble it in and out or left and right? And if it wobbles around and you can hear it banging back and forth and you can move it, then the bearings are too loose and you need to have that repaired, uh, tightened. Uh, new bearings after they're put in will often need to be set and rechecked. So that's something to look for. Look for grease around the hub. In this particular picture, you wouldn't see the grease because there's a cap covering it. Uh, you might think about taking the wheel off to look for the grease, but uh, checking to see if the, um, there's too much free play. There's a, a link in the slides here, which uh, shows you how to do this. Uh, also, if you have a gooseneck, pay particular attention to the rear tires on the trailer, the rear bearings, because you can turn a gooseneck in its length by getting the truck 90 degrees to it, and everybody has done this. They spin it right around. That puts a, an amazing amount of stress on those bearings in the uh, rear wheels, and those are the first ones that will get loose. So. Um, since it's spring right now, we should all just get our trailers out and put them up there and see what the free play is. Next thing we're going to talk about quickly is uh, a one-person electrical test. Uh, it's always better to have somebody walk around the trailer when you've got it all hooked up, you've got the electrical all hooked up, turn on all the lights, walk around. Well, what if you don't have another person? Well, here's a a quick way you and you can't back it up against something shiny to see if the brake lights work turn on all the lights walk around do the turn signals work check each one of them brakes sometimes you can see it at the night you can see the illumination what do you do in the daytime well the four-way flashers they activate the brake lights just turn on the four-way flashers go back and look and so then you know that the brake lights will work um, but the other thing that you need to do is to make sure the brake circuit works. And so the way you do that is put the truck in drive, foot off of the gas and off of the brake, parking brake off, and manually activate the brake controller. That should hold the rig in place on a flat surface. If it doesn't do that, then we need to diagnose why it doesn't do that. That's another discussion we can have. But you have to be able to hold the trailer in place with the manual activation of the brake controller. Uh, again, with no, no gas. I don't know how many of you have done this, but everyone should do this, is to test your own breakaway switch. As most people know, the breakaway switch function is if the trailer and the truck part ways, it pulls the ripcord, if, as it were, to see, uh, to activate the trailer brakes uh, to stop the trailer, okay? And it's connected by a light metal cable to the truck. Um, it is not to be connected to anything that could go with the trailer when the trailer comes disconnected. So connecting it to the ball or something like that, if, if the uh, ball comes out of the receiver, it goes with the trailer along with this cable. It has to be connected independently of everything else hard to the truck. So the way you test this is truck and trailer connected on level ground, okay? No horse in the trailer. Pull the pin out, it's just a plastic pin. Pull it out and try to drive away slowly. The tra trailer brakes should be locked. Then you can put the pin back in and you're good to go. Uh, now, you also need to be aware that this needs to work if the trailer has come disconnected and the electricity to the trailer has come disconnected. So you wanna also do this test by unplugging the trailer from the truck. Pull the pin and see if it stops the truck. Um, if it locks the wheels. There's a specification in New Hampshire, I think in New Hampshire on a, uh, a grade, the breakaway switch and battery is supposed to hold the trailer for it's about 15 minutes or so on. This is in the material here. Um, I'm not sure they actually test that when they inspect them, but that's what the requirement is in New Hampshire. If you have a gooseneck, um, my rule of thumb is you should weigh the gooseneck with your horse and all your stuff. Okay, it's very easy to do, it's kind of fun to do. You put it on there and you see how much everything weighs. I'll just give you a simple little example here. There's a whole bunch of them in the appendix of a nice F-250 that someone has and a, a three horse gooseneck. You see this configuration all the time. Is it actually a legitimate configuration? Now you wanna know that it's legitimate or not for safety reasons also, 
obviously, but also for your insurance liability. If you've overloaded your vehicle and exceeded these things and something happens, your insurance company is probably going to find out about that and they're going to deny the claim in all likelihood. So you want to make sure you're not overweight. So when you do the weighing, um, you'll get numbers for all of the axles and you can do this math then. But if you look just a simple without weighing the trailer and look on the door jam, you'll see the uh, axle gross actual weight ratings for the front and the rear axle. You'll find the maximum towing capacity, which is 12,100 pounds for this truck and the maximum combined weight rating of 19,200 pounds. That's what the truck and load and the people and the dog and the coffee and everything, that's the maximum. So this excess three horse slant gooseneck curb weight is 8,000 and some change. It's gross vehicle weight rating is 14,000 pounds. That's the gooseneck with the horses and the tack and the saddles and everything. All right, so the trailer can hold 14,000 minus the weight of it is 5,360 pounds. So say three horses are uh, 3,300 pounds and you've got 2,000 pounds of stuff. That actually um, is under the capacity of the trailer. So that's all fine in that trailer, 13,940 pounds. But as you can see, it's higher than the towing capacity of that truck. You could didn't have to do that math to know that you could overload it with this trailer because the 14,000 uh, gross vehicle weight rating of the trailer in conceivably could overload the truck depending on how much stuff you put in there. We but have a question though. Question, what's the question? How do we find out what the question what is? So there is a question and it is from Diane. Um, so thanks Diane. So for the breakaway brakes, is there an easy way to check that the length of the chain versus length of the pin before it would become engaged due to a disconnect of the trailer? Yes, that's a really good question. I should have mentioned that. Thank you for asking that. Um, so it's a common error is to have a cable that is really either way too long or way too short. The problem with the too short one, you can tell if it's too short is if you're at the maximum angle that the truck and trailer can make with each other. Uh, this is particularly true for uh, bumper pulls goosenecks not so much because it hangs straight down in the gooseneck but for a bumper pull you should be able to get to whatever your maximum jackknife angle is and not activate the pin so if you if you're pulling the pin at that maximum you know jackknife angle then that cable's too short um if the cable's too long the risk you have is it you're going to want to tie it around all kinds of crazy things like the jack and everything or it's going to be dragging on the ground and getting um uh worn worn out but when the trailer and truck part ways eventually assuming you say you're six inches too long or something it isn't going to matter because that is going to pull that pin so the error is making them too short not typically too long hope that's answered the question i'll assume it has <laughs> and so if not interrupt again please do uh sadly for this truck if we look at the yellow block um, the gross combined weight rating is basically the weight of everything and so if we take the weight of the truck out of that what that tells us is the trailer total plus the stuff that can be allowed in the truck and so here we've got 19,200 minus the weight of the truck says we can have 12,372 pounds okay and if you go through this, you'll see you're only allowed 272 pounds in the truck. Um, that's not a whole lot. If you've got a couple of hefty people and a cooler and a dog and stuff, you can easily get 500 pounds in, in the truck in that case. So it's very easy to get the, the little F-250 overloaded uh, with a three horse gooseneck. And it's one of the reasons my rule of thumb is if you have a gooseneck, put some horses in it. And, since you can't go to an event now, you could put the horses in it and go over to Greenland. It's only about ten dollars to to weigh it, and then you'll know. Keep that um, in case you ever get stopped at a weigh station or something. Keep that uh, that tag with you, and you can show it to them. 
This slide's here mainly for amusement purposes. It's from uh, actually a US government DOT site about properly hooking up a trailer. And so I put some notes on it, um, how it's rusty and everything. The one thing they forgot was the, the breakaway cable. Um, so thank you for that. If you have a bumper pool trailer, it's just a little note here. It's important to know that the wedge latch can falsely connect to the ball. You can think it's connected and not connected. If you have the collar lock kind, it's more of a positive connection. Check your trailer doors and ramps, okay? Uh, Katie talked about the horse fell out of the trailer. It was probably one of these um, latches they can pop open, particularly the older they get, the looser they get. Use a linchpin. Don't ever put a padlock on it, ever. Uh, and double-ended snaps in an emergency, but those can open also. And as the horse can find a way, a trailer with a spring like that, if that guy's leg goes in there, the horse can go in there as well. Annual inspection. I, I'm gonna just skip this slide because we're gonna run out of time. Um, you need to have it done. and the bearings need to be checked every year. Uh, check the age code. Every year, at least, you need to take the mats out of the trailer and wash that. Aluminum floors will rot because of the urine. Uh, don't use lime on them, by the way. That'll just make it worse. Uh, or the wooden floors can rot as well. So every year, you have to have the mats out to be checked. Pre-trip inspection. Adjust the seat and the steering wheel first, then do the mirrors. And do not aim the mirror so you can see the side of your trailer. Aim them so you can see the car you're going to crash into when you change lanes or the ones that are going to overtake you. Always check the air pressure. I know I'm being pedantic repeating that, but always do that. The other thing is the instant you start to hook up your trailer, complete it. Don't stop halfway or talk to anybody. Do it as a single operation because you'll forget to do something. Um, I once hooked up a gooseneck, a car trailer, and then in down in West Palm Beach, and uh, a torrential rain came, and so I went into the shop, and I went back out, got in the truck, and started driving. And then, did I kick that up? I don't know, I pulled over, and nothing was hooked up. It was just sitting on the ball, okay? And I had driven well over 100 miles. Uh, if it was a bumper pull, it wouldn't have stayed on. The gooseneck had enough weight, so it stayed on. So. Um, Few things never to do. Um, I won't go through the whole list, but I'll just mention one. Um, don't drive with horses' heads out the window so they can get some air. Um, you end up with a blind horse from a stone. Uh, never leave the horses unattended. They will try to jump out, as you can see, a small window and get stuck. And that's gonna be a real mess, okay? Um, if you're gonna swap with a truck or a trailer, it's really on you to know that it's the right ball size and that it's all going to work, okay, before you just drive away. Um, never unhook a bumper pull trailer with a horse in it. The, that's gonna be a problem. And never unhook a trailer without wheel chocks. I have a friend who was killed. He got trapped between the trailer and the truck. The truck trailer wasn't uh, chalked and they unhooked it. There was a slight grade and it came and squeezed him. So, okay, so here's some driving tips. We mentioned it before, do not depend on GPS, have a printed map. Uh, don't loiter in someone's blind spot. And you need to know where your blind spots are. And that's the issue with adjusting the mirrors out so you can see them. Um, but you also need to know where other people's blind spots are because no one in cars sets their mirrors properly. They set them so they can look at their car, not look at the blind spot. Um, this is something when I teach people on a racetrack, which is another activity I do, is the very first thing we do is to make sure the mirrors are right for overtaking situations under braking on the racetrack. The same thing is true here, is know where their blind spots are. Don't hang out there because they won't see you and then they're going to do something and pull into you. If you find yourself half on and half off, two wheels on, two on, two off, they say, and if it's a car, don't panic. The number one thing that people do that's an error is they turn the wheel sharply to try to get back onto the road. They jackknife or spin, spin a car or jackknife a trailer. Accept a bad thing to prevent a catastrophic thing. Let me say it again. Accept a bad thing to, to avoid a catastrophic. In a riding 
uh, say, analogy, uh, would you rather have a run out at the trocaner or end up under the log with the horse in the ditch at the trocaner? Of course, you'd rather have the run out. So that's a bad outcome, but it's not a catastrophic outcome. The same is true in driving. Okay, don't panic, go straight, be gentle, slow down while you're going straight, and then gently come back onto the road. That avoids the number one case of crashes. That crash that we talked about in the beginning, where the person that is the error they made, they could have just gone straight, but they panicked and tried to turn it too sharp and jackknifed it. Um, soft shoulders, which fall away, they, they seem to be a major feature in the South. If you ever drive around Aiken, it's terrifying how narrow the roads are and how steep that grade is next to it. It's meant to shed the water. Um, you have to be really diligent because uh, that is like a magnet going to suck you down there. There's not really much way to recover from that. Um, except the wrong turn under situational awareness. You know, if you're in the middle lane and you should have gotten off at this exit, too bad. Go to the next exit, turn around, just accept the wrong turn. Don't swerve to get back on course and always have somewhere to go. We have a rule of thumb in building cross country obstacles is where does the horse go when he doesn't jump the fence? The same is true with driving a trailer. Always have some place to go. Always be thinking about where can I go? Uh, so we good. have a question. Go ahead. The question came in and um, is there a safe way to practice loading a horse onto a trailer, gooseneck or bumper pole, without hitching it to the truck first? Um, you might be able to do that with a gooseneck. Uh, it would, uh, you should still have it chalked. It obviously is going to be in a flat surface. I would see if wherever you ride, you could bring it into the indoor arena and put it in there. I think on a bumper pull, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, it, it can be done in an enclosed place so like if the horse gets loose it was said some practicing it implies maybe there's some going to be an issue that horse might get loose where's the horse going to go now uh is he going to go on the road where's he going to go so if you're going to practice that see if you could do it in a um um enclosed environment um we have done it cases where you put blocks like heavy blocks like cinder blocks and stuff under the rear of the trailer and so and then the trailer is uh, jack is pushed up so it pushes down on those blocks so the and then the wheels are chalked as well and so in that case if you mentally think of that you can make that trailer immovable so it's not going to flex up and down or go anywhere but that requires blocks or jack stands or something secure underneath the rear of the trailer on both sides okay hope that answered the question the slowing down versus thinking about it, that's just something for you to practice your reaction time. It, you spend as much time at 65 miles an hour thinking about slowing down as you do actually stopping with a car. It's worse with a truck and trail. You cannot believe how far you go before you actually start slowing down. Fog is the number one most dangerous driving ha hazard there is for cars, trucks, or trailers. It makes you think you're going slower than you are. Um, your question in the fog is, can you stop in your visibility horizon? Not slow down, can you actually stop? Um, and that's why they have these horrific rear end, um, you know, 70, 80 car pileups. Uh, in this picture here, the, obviously the horse was killed because he got rear ended by a truck. If you don't drive your trailer all the time, you're a novice driver and so you're gonna have longer response times and you're gonna have more variability. Um, dusk and dawn are another thing to consider. You have a false sense that you're seeing clearly due to the way the optical sensors work. Um, turn on the lights, obviously. Never stop in the middle of the road. You're going to get collected from the rear. Um, in some states, actually, it's illegal to be um, driving in uh, fog with flashers on. The reason is that it can confuse somebody. They can think that you're stopped up there when they see the flashing and they'll, they're going to um, actually be confused by that. Uh, Massachusetts and Maine, that's an example of that law. You may have seen this happening. You've seen YouTube videos of this happening. What causes trailer fishtailing? It's usually with bumper pulls. They're more prone to this. <coughs> Not having the right um, 
weight distribution, not enough tongue weight or too much. Excessive downhill speed can start at side arrow loading from uh, wind gusts, uh, driver panic and improper brake balance, excessive trailer brake bias and in your slippery conditions so that it's slippery and you've got too much braking going on in the trailers, incorrect tire flip inflation and so forth. Sometimes you can attenuate this with by manually applying the trailer brakes, not both your, with your foot and finger on the controller, just the trailer brakes, brakes alone. Um, you have to get on it quick. If it starts to happen, you've got about 10 oscillations before then you can't control it. Okay, let's start taking some trips. And so here's four types of trips we've identified. One hour trips, less than three hours, day long trips and overnighters. Uh, we're not going to cover cross country or international flying our horses in this. Don't take a one hour trip for granted. Use the full safety process we've been talking about. Don't forget the equine first aid kit. Every time a horse is in the trailer, Katie's going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, that, and it's often forgotten because you move it into the barn to keep it warm or to whatever, uh, or because it serves double duty. But don't forget that. Make sure you adjust the mirrors. And what else? The air, always check the air. Someone can come get you if you get broken down for a one hour trip, but does that person know that they're on call and is their trailer compatible with your truck and vice versa? A morning or an afternoon trip uh, is very easy to get lazy. Uh, someone still could come get you, um, and but what if you have to stay overnight? You know, bring hay, bring water, assume you might have to stay overnight. Um, one of the students took a, a, a young rider with her mother going to Millbrook to compete, turned a three hour trip into a nine and a half hour trip. Um, easy to do. <clears throat> Day long trips, no one can come get you. And, or if they can, you're gonna be there a long time before they arrive. Uh, so it's useful to know somebody else who's traveling, what's their plans, how many fuel stops are you going to do? Um, Everything should be loaded, packed, and everything, except for the horse, obviously, the day before. Um, bring food and drink. Don't waste time stopping, okay, for food and drink. Printed map, unless you've been there before. And if you're going to a three-day event or something, consider coming back Monday. It's really hard on a three-day event to compete on Sunday and then drive eight hours or nine hours back to where you were, so you're home Sunday night. Um, if you do roll into Millbrook with a flat tire, Tell somebody immediately, and and I guarantee you, someone will change it for you while you're before you even get your uh, stall set up. Overnight trips, like going to Aiken or something like that, are a whole different kettle of fish. Uh, you want to have a full trailer inspection two weeks before leaving. Everything, wheel bearings, everything. Uh, same with the truck. You might bring two mounted trailer tires. If you can't bring two mounted ones, bring one mounted and one unmounted. You can always find places to that will come and mount a tire for you on the road. Okay. Uh, service the truck. If it's in the winter and you have a diesel, bring diesel 911 fuel additive. Um, that also can help you if you get some bad fuel. That happened to Jocelyn and I coming back from Aiken this March with six horses in the trailer. We stopped for gas and, and then all of a sudden there was no power in the truck and we realized, great, they put gas and water in our tank. And so we put some of this in and uh, were able to bleed the water and, and continued on our way. So keep that with you if you have a diesel. Um, everything packed two days beforehand, plan around the weather, be willing to delay for the weather. Um, <clears throat> consider your route and when the rush hours are going to be so you don't just drive off into a two hour traffic jam. And also consider that you have a certain number of hours you can stay awake and your co-pilot can stay awake. There's different theories on this. Um, sometimes people will say, I drive for two hours and you sleep for two hours and we just keep flipping back and forth. And another theory is I drive for seven hours and you sleep for seven and we keep back and forth. Have a plan for that have a fueling plan. Every time you fuel, check the horses obviously um, and blanket them, et cetera. Katie's gonna talk a little bit about that. Bring overnight food and drink with you, particularly if you're doing it now because you don't wanna go into any of those rest stops. They might not even be open. That was our experience. 
uh, coming up from Aiken just recently that uh, some of the places were closed and we weren't going to go into them anyway. Bring the equine first aid kit and the human first aid kit, water jugs, buckets, everything. Um, monitor the horses at every stop, um, more on that in a minute. Maybe about 20 hours is the limit for a fit horse before it's, it's really just stressful. You think about the work that a horse is doing to balance himself back there um, and the temperature changes. Bring everything you need in case you have to lay over for two days and the paperwork. On paperwork in the addendum, there's so uh, first responders form, God forbid you're incapacitated, it's a form for the first responders and then a power of attorney form. You, you wanna go over that with your insurance company. And remember, you can sleep for an hour in a rest stop and let the horses chill if you're tired. Okay, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Rayner. She's gonna talk about keeping the horse healthy while traveling. Thanks, Bill. Um, just a caveat before I get started. A lot of those things Bill talks about in there, um, while they seem simple, when, when things go bad, they're quite frightening. I had a, a couple of those things that he was talking about. I had a couple of them happen on longer trips um, with my horse and it's, it's not pleasant to be in the driver's seat at that point. So being, um, being prepared for all these things and kind of being a little bit neurotic is your, is your best case scenario. So you're not questioning after. Yeah, if I could say something on that. What we're trying to do here, Katie and I, is we're trying to rehearse these things now. So we, we know of all these really bad things that could happen and we're rehearsing them mentally now so that if one does happen, then we're calm. We're sort of schooling these issues now. So if they do happen, we're calm. And I gotta add in, having, having Bill to call right away when something happens is, <laughs> is really nice. So having somebody there, to support you even if they're not actually in the passenger seat it is is quite nice um, so I, I find myself pretty lucky um, things to consider when trailering your horse there's there's a lot but I think the most important ones I put on this slide um, a lot of these times um, in the middle of the night your horse is colicking and it, it is more um, necessary to get the horse to the clinic as soon as possible and unfortunately with that, depending on who's hooking up your trailer can um, turn into a very quick hookup. And that, that causes issues um, in the middle of winter when there's a bunch of snow, uh, tires aren't routinely checked and um, hookup may not be as, as well as it should be. Your hands are cold, you wanna get in the truck, but those are the, those are the kind of times that you really wanna prepare for. Um, I know at the farm, they always plow and get rid of the snow in front of the trailers, which is really kind of a comfort for anybody who needs to get their horse out right away. Um, and luckily we haven't really had many of those nights, but they're not really, they're not fun. Um, Bill taught me this one. I never even considered it, which seems silly now in hindsight, but a fire extinguisher um, in your truck and um, in your trailer, to be honest, and easy, easy to get to. I, I don't know why I never thought of that until, you know, a couple of years ago, but um, it is very important because what are you gonna do on the road if you have a fire in your trailer? Um, a knife is, is crazy important. And I found that out in vet school um, in a, a trailer accident. Um, the horse actually was down in the trailer and was stuck and the um, ties could not be undone from him via the, how it was hooked up. And so the only way we could get him loose was a, a knife or sharp pair of scissors and, and luckily we had them. But um, if you don't have that available, you're really struggling to get that horse free quickly. Extra halters, um, I'm sure every horse person is gonna have that. Plenty of water, um, especially what Bill was saying. Consider yourself, think, just think that you may get stuck for a bit and be prepared. I think the temp in the trailer is really important also to consider and I do, being around horse people all the time. I know everyone really likes a horse to be warm, but in my opinion, um, I feel that it is better actually for a horse to be a little bit on the chillier side than the warm side, as far as um, preventing the disease processes from occurring. Additionally, depending on how many horses are in the trailer um, and what your trailer setup is and what time of year it is, um, it's really important to not over blanket your horse, but also to have some good airflow to to prevent a lot of the respiratory things that can happen while trailering. 
um, they, there's also the ability to have a thermometer in your trailer. Um, I think it would be really cool to have a setup so you know what the trailer temp is when you're driving. That's a little advanced um, and not really necessary for every trailer, but I do think it is something really important to consider um, to know how warm or cold your horse is. Um, I get into the habit, if my horse has a blanket on, uh, every time I stop, I make sure I, I feel in his hand that he doesn't get too warm or too cold for that matter. Um, I am a big fan of shipping boots and it goes back to that first image. I don't think shipping boots would have saved that horse, um, to be honest, but I do think it would have reduced a lot of the, the distal limb stuff that was happening. Um, he still would have gotten injuries from falling out of a, a trailer, don't get me wrong, but I do believe that there just adds on another um, layer to reduce how bad those, those um, injuries can be. Um, so I'm a big fan of shipping boots. Um, I also think that that coronary band would have been protected uh, as well. Um, some people think that they can cause some issues. I do know several horses end up kicking more with them, and so every horse is individual. Um, and I, I'm not, you know, I'm not there to dictate yes or no, but I do find that, that there are less injuries and I actually find them really important for getting on and off the trailer. Cause unfortunately, a lot of the times that the distal limb injuries occur are getting on and off the ramp. Um, it's pretty common knowledge, but they, there was a study that I cited here where they talk about amateur riders and, and drivers having more of an increased risk of trailer accidents and uh, equine injuries. Um, and that's kind of why, you know, Bill wanted to start all this stuff because there's, there's no real rules for anyone to drive a trailer. Anyone can go out once they have a license and drive a trailer, right? Um, I did it as well without having a bunch of information. You know, I was able to hook up a trailer and, and go. And when you're driving straight and everything's good, it's fine, um, but if you don't know how to get yourself out in a pinch, you get into a lot of trouble. Um, and yes, we can learn as we go, but in, in some of these situations, you don't wanna learn from your mistakes. Um, sedation increases the risk significantly in horses. Um, we see this a lot, probably a lot more than, than normal people um, because people aren't sedating their horses to go to horse shows because it's illegal. However, um, you know, when people are trying to get horses used to trailering, they do use sedation, and unfortunately, that creates our ataxia or a weak gait and um, difficulty understanding where their feet are. And so, if you do go around a turn a little too quickly, if you do stop a little too quickly, um, they aren't able to counteract themselves as quickly as they normally would without sedation. And this includes um, ace promazine, not just the big guns, it's not just the Dermosidan or the xylazine, the, the ACE can also cause a delayed reaction time. And just something to consider, because um, I know a lot of clients do have some ACE on hand at their, at their barn. I would just be careful with it. Um, and then I, I thought this was an interesting fact, and it, it's quite important to understand. So over half of the injuries are the lower limbs. Um, and so they put the percentages here on, on a group of horses that were in, in trailer accidents. But the the reason why I think it's important to talk about is because distal limb injuries are more severe and more commonly causing um, unsoundness and um, sometimes not return to the soundness if you know joint spaces are involved or soft tissue injuries are involved and that's kind of you know what we're why we are traveling with our horses is, is to show them and so those kind of injuries are ones you really want to reduce the likelihood of happening having so so it's good to do everything you can to prevent those. Um, I think for everybody, all my clients, I tell them this because when they call me for an emergency, I wanna know um, some of the information. Heart rate's important to know in a horse because that dictates if they're in pain or not, um, or dehydrated as well. So the normal heart, heart rate is, is 36. Um, any horse is gonna range between 28 to, to 48, and that's within normal limits. Um, good to know your horse's normals anyway but I think that if you are able to take their heart rate you don't even need a stethoscope you can um, take their pulse right underneath their jaw um, to kind of understand where they're at. Uh, normal temperature is 99.5 to 101.5 um, depending on how your trailer is set up you may or may not be able to take that but um, 
that that does tell you what their core temp is and kind of allows you to know where the, where they're at if they're in trouble. Respiratory rate, um, you can either put your hand um, over one of their nostrils and feel them breathing, or you can look at their abdomen um, and count how many breaths they take in 15 seconds and times that by four, and that's how many you have. Um, elevated respiratory rate obviously means that they're um, in a little bit of trouble. So there's lots of things you can do to counteract that while keeping them on the trailer. Um, the other thing is uh, you can look at their gums. So CRT is capillary refill time. Uh, you just press on their gums and let go and see how fast that color returns. Should be less than two seconds. Um, mucous membrane, just by palpating their, their gum line, that'll tell you if they're dehydrated or not. Um, it should be pink and moist. If it's dry and tacky, then, then you do have a degree of physical dehydration. And the other thing you can do is pinch their neck uh, or shoulder, and if that skin stays elevated, then they are physically dehydrated. Um, if a horse has muscle fasciculations while in the trailer, um, so every horse is a little different. There are some horses that get a little nervous on the trailer, and muscle fasciculations are quite normal, um, but those should go away. But um, that's, a, that's important for, for knowing your horse at that point. Um, my horse, for some reason, does it almost every time I put him on the trailer. But about three minutes after getting on the trailer, um, he stops. So that's kind of his normal. Um, but if he was doing it halfway into a you know, five-hour ride, then I'd be a little bit more concerned. Excessive pawing, abnormal trailer behavior. There, there are some horses that like to paw on the trailer particularly when you're stopped. So when you're moving, they usually aren't doing it, but if you stop for gas, they start up again. So again, know your horse, but they're, um, if it's not a common behavior, um, then something's obviously going on. And it's always important to know, it doesn't have to be just on a trailer ride, but to know that they're producing normal amounts of manure and urine. Um, if a horse goes on a six hour trail, trailer ride and has no manure, then you know that there's a little bit of trouble there. Um, so all those are really important to, to, to monitor and have knowledge of um, to make sure that your horse is as fit as can be. Um, some things you can do for, for a horse that is stressed on a trailer. Obviously, if they're warm and they have a blanket on, take that blanket off. Um, I always travel with one to two liters of alcohol. Um, it, not the after 5 p.m. alcohol, but the isopropyl alcohol. Uh, and I use that because it will reduce the core temperature quite significantly, um, even without banamine, if you just pour it over their top line. And it's really good, especially for those hot summer, summer events um, that we go to that it's 90 degrees and they're, they're trailering. So it's always good to have those on, on hand. Um, because you know, those shows, depending on when you're going, you can't use a non-steroidal to reduce their temp. Um, and there, you know, there's a lot of thirst quenchers out there for horses to get them to drink and, and eat better on the, on the trailer. So those kind of things you just have to play with on, on what works for your horse. Um, this is just, this is an example of one of the first aid kits that we carry. Everyone's first aid kit can have some different stuff in, but th these are kind of the the essential items, obviously, that it's not a complete list. Um, so stethoscope, but again, you can take heart rate and respiratory rate um, without a stethoscope uh, thermometer and make sure you label it that it's your horse only so it's not used at home. Um, bandage material, I think tape's really important. That's why I put an exclamation mark there. And scissors, um, antiseptic per usual. I like betadine, but chlorhexidine is appropriate as well. Um, alcohol in your safety kit as well. Uh, a towel always comes in handy. Non-steroidals um, to be used with the vet in mind and then anything else that is going to help you. I think bandage material is super important um, there. And back to Bill. Okay, that's, that's a quick flyby and, and uh, for amusement at the end, uh, you can see the Shetland Pony Stud Service um, they cared about trailer safety back then. It was a happy horse. His eyes were protected. He loaded well, apparently, and the eyes of the driver are protected as, as well. Um, so uh, 
I, again, would encourage you to download the slides. Um, they're on SlideShare, and you also have in uh, the back and an appendix section additional reference material. Um, there's a couple of pages in there that are designed to be printed and taken with you. One of them, for example, is the electrical connections for your trailer, what each of the pins does. And just print that out, take it with you. There's access to the uh, first responder form. It's good to have that in case you're incapacitated and the power of attorney form uh, for the same reason. But again, check with your insurance company if your horse is insured about using that form. Uh, so if there's any questions, feel free now um, uh, or any other topics you want to discuss that we, we didn't cover, we're happy to do that. And of course, um, you can always reach us electronically too. We like questions. Um, this is Liz. So real quick before we start taking questions, I'd like to thank both Bill and Dr. Rayner for joining us this evening. This was really special and we were fortunate to be able to pivot from our original intent, which was to hold a actual seminar in person. So um, we're happy that we were able to reimagine our offering and that so many of you were able to join us tonight. So thank you very much. And there are a couple of questions coming through in the chat right now. You can also unmute your microphones if you'd like to chime in. And everyone who is pre-registered will receive an email thanking you and may uh, contain the link to this uh, reference material and the addendum online. If I could interject something, I saw one of the questions here, would the PowerPoint be available? Um, yes, and you can download it as well from SlideShare. Uh, there's another um, uh, presentation there, which is a day-long seminar that also has an example of uh, extracting a horse from a crash trailer with the first responders and exactly how that's done. I'm not anticipating that many of us uh, will ever have to do that. I hope not. But it's useful to know how they do it and, and why it's done that way. And uh, we'll make that link available. That's available for download as well. Thank you. Um, Bill and Katie, can you see the chat questions or would you like me to read them to you? We can see them. Perfect. You're flying by. <laughs> um, there's, is look like this one. What do you do when you get hit or have a bad feeling someone is about to hit you uh, to decrease the severity of the accident? That's a really uh, good and sophisticated question. It relates uh, to, for example, when I was talking about accepting a bad outcome to prevent a catastrophic one. It's like accept the run out instead of going into the ditch under the trainer. Um, it, you should have situational awareness, like try, for example, not to be in the cruising, in the passing lane, stay in the cruising lane. But, but you may run into a situation where um, you've detected the body language of other vehicles or, around you is, um, is bad. Okay, something's about to happen. And, and so I would say the, the number one thing I would try to be doing is to be slowing down safely, not jamming on the brakes and uh, losing steering, and be going straight. Um, always try to be going straight. Um, I know of a case where somebody actually was able to slow their vehicle down. This sounds gross by actually going against the guardrail and using the guardrail going straight. It, it kind of wrecked the side of the trailer and the truck, but they stopped safely and nobody was hurt. And it just caused a cosmetic mess to everything, but it was safe. And so think about how you can continue going straight. Do not follow somebody so close. And you, you know, we all have muscle memory that we're used to driving in a car probably too close or whatever, but in a truck, Try that reaction time and do that math on that slide and you'll be amazed how you can't stop. And so you need to leave space. It's a pain on the highway because four wheelers, as they call them, or cars are gonna be always filling that gap in front of you and they're not gonna respect you, but just live with that. Don't get upset by it, leave space. I saw um, another question was, do you recommend full or half dividers? And actually Bill and I had a discussion about that recently. Um, I think either one, I, what I don't like is when there's just a, when the divider goes not uh, only a couple inches to the ground. I think full dividers are pretty safe um, and half dividers, 
also are relatively safe. I think horses can hit each other on them. Yeah, they, they people don't like them because they get kicked at each other yeah. or something like like that. But um, compared to getting, and could they get down if the horse is down? All the way down, they might get stuck a little bit under that. The only way to prevent that is a divider that goes right to the floor um, and that they can't get under like in a professional trailer. They just can't do it. Um, let's see, there's a couple other here. Um, tying horses. Um, I'll, one thing I know we don't like is the elastic ones that stretch because the horse will stretch them. They'll snap and come back and take an eye out. Okay. Um, there should be obviously a uh, quick release. Although Katie mentioned the example with, uh, they were unable to release that and had to cut the, the cross tie, okay? Um, I wouldn't want, you, you have to be able to tie the horse so he has some movement of neck, but, but you know, not so far that he can get himself in trouble underneath the chest bar and, and so on and so forth. Which one is this? There's a question about travel. Do you see that one? When looking at a map for travel, is there another way to figure out the route? When we drove back from Aiken, there were a few roads I would not want to take. One of them being Route 95. <laughs> <laughs> or Sawmill Parkway. Uh, yeah, uh, but a rule of thumb is parkway is no way. You, if it's a parkway, you cannot take a trailer on it, ever. Okay, no parkways. Garden State Parkway, Sawmill Parkway, no parkway, no, no way. Um, and so know those uh, rules of, of thumb. Um, the, yeah, there are, uh, so the truckers use this, and even with the trucker uh, atlases, which used to be popular, people don't have them so much anymore. There are truck routes that show you where the truck stops are, where you can service a diesel, et cetera, et cetera, and, and where there's, you know, legitimate routes for truckers. And, and so if you search those sites, they'll tell you sort of anywhere that is good for truckers is, is usually good for a horse trailer. Um, there, those sites are available. You can contact me, and I can send them to you. Uh, two horse bumper pull is the right or left, uh, which if you have one horse and a two horse bumper pull, um, if you put the horse on the, what's called the curb side, uh, then you're biasing the weight that side. And with the camber of the road, that's a crown of the road that tends to pull it to that side. So a lot of people will load it, um, on the, um, what's called the street side. So it balances the trailer better with the natural tendency. The disadvantage of, of that is, is some people feel on a two lane highway, you're more likely to get hit on that side. And so they'll argue, well, I'll take the imbalance of the trailer and put the horse on the curb side. So it's a little bit of pick your poison in that case. Is it safe to travel with horses in the trailer with the rear top doors open? Better keep it enclosed. Um, That's a good question. It depends on those doors. So for example, um, some rear trailer doors, when they're open, will fold flat. And so they don't pick up the wind. And those are safe. Um, usually the ones that are like that also, they're not, the percentage that's window is maybe 40% or less. So meaning the, the gate in the back is 60% is or more of the height. So it's a small area. It's less likely that some, you know, to get out of that. Uh, some of the rear windows, they don't fold flat. And so they're, they're like a sail picking up the wind. That's unsafe to travel with it open. Um, and those can actually come off and then start flapping around. You may not know that it's happened when that's happened. Can slamming on the brakes cause the horse to fall, become seriously injured? Um, uh, well, if you need to stop, you need to stop. And, and, um, but slamming on the brakes so that you're locked up, you've taken away steering. You want what's called threshold braking, which is right at the edge of lockup. Most people have anti-lock brakes now because uh, that was an invention because uh, it's too sophisticated to be able to go at threshold braking, uh, which is more of like a, if you race on a racetrack, you're able to do that. But um, so you're probably unlikely with ABS to lock up. And so if you have to put the brakes on, you have to put the brakes on. Um, but a way to think about this as a general driving thing and to try to train yourself before you get to the point of slamming on the brakes is imagine you're, you've got eggs 
you're transporting eggs and there's also eggs underneath the, the accelerator and the brake. And so you want the transitions to be balanced. You don't want the weight to transport forward or back acceleration or braking inordinately. Um, and, but the horse, if, the, if it's in the trailer properly and the trailer is safe, it, it should be okay. It's gonna have a rough ride when it bumps into the breast bar. It's why some people like slant loads, okay? Um, but it should be able to deal with it. I just want to interject there because I've had a lot of cases with pretty sick horses coming to the clinic. Um, if, if a horse goes down in the trailer and you can feel it and you are heading towards a place, either a hospital or if you're going to a horse show, in my opinion, it's better not to check. Um, you're not going to do much on the side of a highway um, for that horse. Um, and you could also get pretty decently hurt. Um, so in my opinion, if a horse goes down in the trailer and you're relatively close to where you're going, um, it's much better to wait because um, you are not going to get that horse out without help. And you don't want to get that horse out on a highway setting. Another question we have here is how much under towing capacity should your loaded trailer be? Um, well, they're designed so that they can be run at that capacity, but um, you know, for how long as they get older, things will wear out. And, and um, the one thing that you can do yourself a favor with is you can get tires that will fit your trailer that have more capacity than your trailer was designed for. Usually what they do to keep the price down is they'll, um, and I, I put up a slide here now, I don't know if you can see it, but it's tire pressure versus carrying capacity. Um, and you can get tires that will fit your trailer, but they're the next size, the next rating up. And that will give you a safety margin. They're, they cost more, obviously, um, and they take more air, obviously, but they can carry more load, so they have a higher safety margin. If you can avoid putting the, um, the load, horses and stuff, above, say, 85% of the rated gross vehicle uh, carrying capacity, then that would be sort of a, a reasonable design center. But like I said earlier, if you have a gooseneck, um, I'd say probably half of the people who have a gooseneck are in a situation where they can overload their truck with the gooseneck. Um, which uh, slant or straight load? Um, well, at Coyote Spring Farm, there's both. I think uh, the uh, consensus would be that the straight load is better, particularly the EB6 horse, because you can service the horses from being in the trailer. They all are pointing at each other and they ride pretty nice in that. Um, the disadvantage of the slant load, while the horse can lean against the whole divider and, and that helps with his braking uh, and accelerating issue, is if you have to get the middle horse out in the three horse, how do you do that? And that's a real problem. A lot of uh, slant loads also don't have a front exit door. And if you get rear-ended, then you can't get any horses out. Uh, so um, if it were me and I'm getting a, a trailer, I would get straight load at this point. Uh, like a two plus one gooseneck is a good example of that. Bill, that brings us back to a question I don't know we covered about the two plus one. Is it better to load in the box stall in the front with one horse or a straight stall? And what are your opinions, both of you, for long trip shipping better in a box stall or a straight stall tied or untied? I think it depends a lot on the horse and Agreed. the particulars of that box stall. Um, you know, is there other stuff in it with the horse? <laughs> okay, how big is it? Um, I know uh, Jocelyn has a trailer that can, can be configured with three box stalls in, uh, in it uh, or combinations of box stalls and straight stalls. So she has transported both ways with that. Some horses will, will go okay in the box stall and they're, they're perfectly happy with that. They'll, they'll find their position. Um, and it also depends on the driver being kind and not throwing that horse around in corners and, and braking and so forth. Other horses um, that are not going to do well in that. I think it's uh, Katie may want to comment on that, but it's horse specific. I think it's horse specific, but also what you're doing. I do know horses like like to balance up against the bars um, for long travel. 
Um, but I do, I uh, did it this weekend. There was a horse that was down and needed to come to the clinic and they made their trailer into a box stall um, in case that horse went down because they can get quite difficult to get up um, with dividers and bars. Um, so, and, you know, with sedation on board, that, that gets even trickier. But I, I do think for long distance travel, if you're not in an air ride, I do think having that um, support and protection on a straight load or a slant load um, I think horses do seem to do better, but it, it definitely is horse specific. Question here, what's essential to have in the trailer for a roadside fix? Um, first of all, uh, a jack, to t uh, uh, I'm sorry, lug nut to take the lug nuts off and uh, a trailer aid or something to get the trailer up. Um, although you'd be surprised, I, uh, years ago, uh, someone called, um, I was at Millbrook and they were on their way to Millbrook and they said, we've got a blowout on the Mass Pike and we don't have anything um, and to jack the trailer up. And we're able to talk them through finding boards and logs um, on the side of the road to drive the trailer up on. Um, so, and you need uh, to bring a lantern, not a flashlight, but a lantern, because if you're doing it yourself or you might want to set that down in a way that people can see it at night. So one of these like camp lanterns or something that, um, and the uh, appropriate uh, tire lug nut, uh, you know, T-bar or something is a good one that you can use your foot and your hand um, and make sure you can pick up the tire. There are tools you can get that will pick up the tire. Like it's like a sort of a lever system. It's in the appendix and that actually works really well. Bill, do you know of any trailer driving classes in the New England area? Not for little trailers like this. I mean, obviously there are um, courses for um, 18 wheelers and so forth, but I, I think for small trailers like this that are not commercial, I don't know of any. That's a good little homework problem. We should probably try to find something out. I would say, I by the way. Interject. I know that um, some of the dealers, particularly I've heard specifically from Trevelyan down in Rhode Island do offer trailer driving tips for new purchases at their facility down there. So it might be something to inquire of some of these. Um, That's a good you know. suggestion. The other thing I would say, and again, take advantage of the current situation we're all in right now. We're not going to events. This is a time to if you have a gooseneck or even if you have a bumper pull put your horses and everything in it as if you're going to show and drive over to the scales and weigh it and it's it's a nice little saturday afternoon thing it'll take a few minutes to do the other thing is um you should practice with your trailer with no horse in it uh, particularly backing up um, <laughs> Um, you can back it into yeah. a parking space, put some cones out, go to um, a Walmart parking lot or, or someplace where uh, there's, because nobody's at these places now, put the cones out and see, because that's what the test is when they give you the test to see if you can back straight in between cones. Do you have a preference between or, a, yeah, step up or a ramp? Um, it, some horses are perfectly fine uh, with stepping up and stepping down. Uh, the, the ramps, one thing to be cautious about the ramps is they can get slippery as can be in the rain. Um, and you can get a sisal mat, that, that's a good uh, option of if you ever ship your horse professionally, like with you know, one of the professional shippers, they'll have those type of mats so the, there's more purchase. Um, the other thing about the ramps is you need to grease the, the, the fittings like a lot because they lose the grease and they can get very difficult to lift. They're very sticky. Um, and then the springs on them will start creaking while you're lifting it. And so you're exposed. The horse is right there behind you. The springs are creaking and you just know he wants to kick your face in. And so that's the disadvantage of, of the ramps. We have uh, some that work well in the commercial trailer. The ramp is extremely heavy. It almost takes two people to lift it. Um, but that's fine. I kind of like the ramps better personally myself, but again, that some horses don't like going up and they're fine with the step, step up or step down. Um, it's, it's again, it's not unlike the box stall question. It's horse specific. 
There was an earlier question too about your opinions about a horse van or box versus a trailer situation. A lorry. In, that's a lorry, yes. Popular in, in Europe because everything is, the roads are smaller and, and everything. Bill, Katie, are you there? We lost him for a moment.